Hello. Hello. Okay, let's get started. Welcome to Issues in Environmental Science. Today is October the 27th, and we're gonna be talking this week about fossil fuel, fossil energy fuel and energy use. Um, we'll be looking at the way in which fossil fuels impact the environment, uh, both through uh, direct impacts and through release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which promotes climate change. I can't change. hear you, Dr. McDonald. I don't, I don't know if you're talking to us, but you're muted. I'm muted. Really? I hear you. I can hear. Yep, him. I can hear him. I can hear you just fine, sir. That is my bad. I had my computer muted. <laughs> okay, you're muted. I'm not muted. <laughs> no worries. Very sorry. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. We'll get started. Um, let's see. Got to do this right. Okay, so you should be seeing uh, the screen here, the PowerPoint presentation. This PowerPoint presentation is in the module. You can get a uh, series of, uh, of handouts that you can take notes as you follow along. And I try to copy these into every uh, module, so that's been available. Um, I do make changes up until the last minute sometimes, so um, uh, you know, it's worthwhile downloading the, the most recent version. So uh, we'll look at uh, energy consumption and supply trends, uh, energy and science, and then we'll be looking in general at fossil fuels. We'll go through coal, oil, uh, offshore energy production, oil spills. We'll look at fracking and natural gas, uh, all as different sources of fossil fuel. And uh, today, oops, that's the wrong session. Today we'll be talking about um, uh, mostly fossil fuels, and I'll be lecturing for most of the, of the class. On uh, Thursday, we'll continue with this material. Carrie O'Reilly will be presenting uh, a, uh, about a 25-minute talk over her uh, thesis work and ongoing dissertation work. She'll be looking at the oil spill in Mississippi Canyon 20, which is uh, still ongoing, although that's been contained somewhat. Um, and there'll be breakout sessions for milestone two, milestone three discussions. So there'll be uh, more limited uh, breakout sessions during this week, um, but you still will have a chance to get together and, and talk over issues. And then we'll be, um, at the conclusion, there'll be a, a, an open uh, Q&A period on, on both uh, today and Thursday. So I wanted to spend some time on fossil fuel and the environment uh, because this is such a huge issue. It, it impacts so many aspects of uh, consideration of climate change, environmental uh, health and, and stability, uh, law and policy, a lot of the polarization between uh, the two political parties and political philosophies, uh, you know, which are now so much uh, in the forefront, have to do with how we should organize our use of energy and the way in which our use of energy uh, impacts both the present day and uh, the near future. And so this is a huge issue. The more that we can understand the science um, and the, uh, the tangible aspects of the policy which um, derives from the science, the better we'll be equipped we'll be uh, to go forward as informed citizens and professionals uh, in the world in which uh, the decisions that we make in the coming decade or so about how we use fossil fuels, how we transition our energy supply, both nationally and internationally, are gonna have um, 
profound and far-reaching impacts. It's, it's really hard to overemphasize uh, this. So um, we're going to present a lot of this material in depth. The, the chapter in um, Hasenzal, chapter 11, uh, describes a lot of the material. I'm going to overlap a little bit with that, uh, with that uh, chapter material, but then I'm going to get into material that I think uh, deserves greater uh, exploration than was provided in an otherwise pretty good chapter within Hasenzal. Um, so what are we looking at here? This is a picture of a, a jack-up rig, a jack-up rig. So these are, this is a, a, a kind of um, energy a drilling or energy production platform. And these uh, pilings here are, um, can be raised and lowered. So when this, and this, the water depth here would be pretty shallow, you know, uh, less than 100 feet most likely. And uh, so this, uh, this uh, drilling platform or production platform is towed offshore. And when it's in position, then these, uh, these legs are lowered and they come all the way down to the bottom of the ocean and then gradually lift the platform above the level of the, of the ocean. And then the wells and the drilling is executed here. I took this picture offshore because it was striking that when we were there, there was this huge uh, uh, a plume of, uh, of gas bubbling up around the platform there. I don't want to imply that that's a, uh, a huge oil spill because this, uh, like many other sort of incidents offshore, this was not reported. Uh, there wasn't a big oil slick in place. Uh, but this kind of accident and these kinds of concerns uh, pervade the, uh, the, the energy industry. And so uh, it's useful to have a, a tangible example of that. And I'll be presenting other tangible examples as we go forward. So um, our uh, sort of the history of energy usage here in a, in a single slide sort of shows the way in which we uh, transition from different sources of energy. And I'll be getting back to this and looking at that in more detail. But you know, in the 1860s, so more than 150 years ago, um, most of our fuel came from uh, uh, wood and uh, coal, so the, the primary sources in, in you know, 150 years ago did not include uh, oil, gas, uh, and certainly some of the more exotic, certainly none of the, none of the uh, renewable oil. It's not true to say that the renewable resources were not important or renewable energy sources were not important back in the 1800s because a lot of the industrial um, uh, capacity in the country was driven not by uh, coal, not by wood, but by water power, the mechanical power of water uh, used to turn uh, turbines and the belts from these turbines drove uh, looms and um, lathes and industrial machinery of all different sorts. Um, so, um, you know, in, in the day, uh, coal was a, a fraction probably of the total energy used, mostly used for heating and lighting. Uh, transition up to about 1900. Uh, around 1900 is when we start seeing uh, the production of, uh, of oil as a significant factor in uh, energy uh, consumption. The uh, production of oil uh, began in Pennsylvania. Um, and initially, the oil that was produced was used for lubrication. Uh, so it's an excellent uh, lubricant for uh, turning uh, machinery. And so that was the principal uh, use of oil. And then gradually, uh, use of oil as a, as a fossil fuel or as a fuel to drive uh, lighting, um, uh, heating, uh, and eventually um, steam powered uh, uh, industrial plants sort of began around this era. And you can see there's a study uh, upward ramp in here. Uh, not shown here is the way in which um, military uh, requirements drove the transition from uh, coal to oil. Um, military ships and shipping of all kinds, uh, when it became mechanized, when steam engines uh, allowed to ships to power themselves and drive without uh, use of wind uh, sources, the fuel for that initially was coal. Um, and so, you know, coal is sort of the Titanic, for example. You probably remember the, the movie Titanic and you remember those guys uh, who worked down in the, in the boiler room shoveling coal into these giant burners that uh, heated the, the water to dry the steam that, that uh, propelled the ship. Um, well, uh, having coal and needing coal put a huge uh, uh, 
uh, infrastructure demand on uh, shipping, and that was particularly impactful for military shipping. So around uh, the time of the, the First World War, the uh, military forces began transitioning from coal-fired um, uh, ships to oil-fired uh, ships. And um, you know, that transition you know, really sort of revolutionized uh, uh, military and naval power, uh, but also was part of a change in which oil increasingly became part of our, trans our transportation sector. And you can sort of uh, follow the trend here, but coal remains an important component <coughs> of our energy use. And you know, going through to the you know the late uh, 19th century, the beginning of the well, the late uh, 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, you can see that oil uh, displaces uh, coal and gas. And then we get this interesting series of transitions. So you know, here we are, right about here at about uh, 2020. Uh, coal is still an important uh, component of our. Um, uh, energy system, but it's rapidly declining and it's being replaced by uh, gas, um, natural gas, and increasingly in the United States, that natural gas is produced by hydraulic fracturing. Uh, oil consumption is down, and more recent trends uh, show that uh, oil consumption uh, has been impacted. Um, you know, you probably all noticed that the price of gas at the pump is now hovering around $2, That's a big change from about a year ago when it was well above uh, three dollars and so that's the impact of, uh, of a different economy under the uh, COVID scenario. All right so um, you know here's a more um, uh, detailed uh, consumption this goes through 2018. Um, these data come from uh, BP. BP produces uh, British Petroleum. Uh, BP produces a biannual report on energy which is uh, actually quite good, quite factual, the data in there are very well vetted. And so I always look at that uh, if I'm interested in the latest trends. Well, their most recent report was issued in 2019. And so this updates through about 2017. And you can see here that coal remains an important component. Oil um, is, a you know, between oil and coal, that's describing worldwide, um, you know, the, the way in which uh, oil is supplied. And, U.S. Uh, energy consumption is, is a bit different, and we're becoming less dependent on coal, um, more dependent on natural gas. Uh, you can see that uh, nuclear energy, which is often uh, uh, put forward as a potential alternative, has remained a really tiny fraction of the total um, uh, energy supply. And um, uh, renewables um, are increasing. Let's see, the renewables are here. So this is nuclear energy, this is renewables. And so renewables are steadily increasing. And I think that trend is due to accelerate over time. Um, if we look at greenhouse gas emissions, so this is the concern for um, you know, the way in which uh, greenhouse gases by economic sector are um, generated. And this gives us an idea of what you take that total energy profile and apply it to the different uh, uh, components of society that supported transportation, uh, residential power, electric generation, industry, and so forth, and look at how um, those activities produce greenhouse gases. Uh, and you can see that um, you know, transportation remains a very high component. Electric electricity generation uh, comes in second, and then industrial consumption. So the big three uh, in our energy picture and our greenhouse gas production picture are transportation, uh, electricity generation, and industrial activity. Um, so this is a, kind of in a nutshell why we can look at a, you know, how um, uh, fuel economy standards for, for automobiles or phasing out of coal fire power plants, you know, can have a disproportionate effect on the amount of a greenhouse gas uh, transmission. So if we're able to, you know, transition to electric cars in a large uh, degree, and then we start generating our uh, electricity for those cars, not from coal, but from um, renewable sources and natural gas, the amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions could be expected to fall. So, um, you know, this is a, a looking uh, looking at how we can predict that these changes will uh, 
what kind of trends we might have under different uh, scenarios of transition. And so this is looking at how we transition our energy uh, production and energy supply uh, in the future, starting at a 2019-2020 start point. So here we are, and this is where we can go in the coming um, you know, uh, 20 years. So over the next two decades, what's going to happen? And uh, we can see scenarios of rapid transition. And so this could start uh, you know, reducing the amount of greenhouse gas production significantly, um, but this would require huge changes. And so um, you know, if we look at rapid transition, we can see that uh, oil and gas remain a, an important uh, component, but renewables uh, become uh, increasingly, uh, increasingly significant if there's rapid transition. Um, you know, more energy uh, simply keeps the, uh, the, the focus of, of, of energy production on the traditional sources, oil, gas, and coal. Um, so, you know, the, the, this transition and which of these scenarios will play out, of course, has a major impact on what kind of climate change uh, acceleration we can expect and uh, is going to require um, some very different sets of choices. And that was uh, brought to the fore, I thought, uh, in the most recent uh, presidential debate. Um, and the two sides uh, you know, could not be uh, more clearly stated. Uh, so uh, uh, Vice President Biden said that we needed to transition away from fossil fuels uh, because fossil fuels were, in his words, polluting the environment. I think he might more accurately have said that fossil fuels are promoting uh, greenhouse gas and greenhouse gas emissions, but that's what he said. He, he said it very clearly. Uh, the other um, opposing uh, point of view, uh, represented by uh, President Trump, immediately seized on that and said, well, you know, this is going to have a gigantic impact on the economy. And, and President Trump uh, went as far as saying that um, transitioning away from fossil fuels would destroy American economy, and in particular would destroy the economies respectively of Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Pennsylvania, swing states that are important in the election. Um, so, you know, the different choices that we make and how these choices play out have a have a, uh, an impact, and they're very much part of our political discussion, as I said at the output. Um, well, can we look at uh, recent changes? So, you know, COVID, so this is a very recent diagram. This is the last uh, nine months or so. Um, I'd, I'd like to see this, these trends. I think these trends uh, go for, you know, continue more or less stable. So there was a, you know, here was our, um, you know, baseline. So there was a, you know, a decrease of about 5%. And, you know, in the, when the pandemic, uh, initial phase of the pandemic was at its peak, um, you know, the reduction in nitrous oxides. Now this reduction in nitrous oxides, what this represents is, is um, nitrous oxides are produced, as you might recall from the previous lecture, uh, by primarily from emissions from uh, cars and other and trucks and, and that sort of transportation. So there was a real fall off here. Um, you know, carbon dioxide fell off as well. And that reflects um, you know, sort of a general uh, constriction of uh, industrial output and, as well as transportation, airline transportation in particular. But none of these changes um, uh, are significant enough or expected to have a long-term impact on the um, well, the, the article that I took this from um, said that uh, Science News said that there shouldn't be a, a, a long-term impact. But I think that you know, if, if, you know, if we were able to achieve a uh, 15 or 20% reduction, if that became a sort of a, you know, a long-term average, then there would be an impact. Uh, so it very much, you know, we, we're very, still very much in the, in the opening phases of the, the, the post or the, you know, the COVID world. And we have to see how um, working from home, uh, you know, reduced travel, reduced air travel uh, impacts these, uh, these changes going forward. So uh, I think it maybe it's still too early to say whether or not that's gonna occur. All right, uh, let me step forward a little bit and just sort of basically, um, you know, the, the, the trends uh, are unsustainable. Um, the projections of, you know, how much, uh, uh, you know, oil and gas we're using, these, uh, these trends, you know, will both, well, it's not really fair to say that they'll outstrip supply, 
um, but they will certainly outstrip the capacity of the environment to absorb the impacts of, of fossil fuels going forward. Um, you know, I, I think that if the demand for oil and gas were to continue unabated, uh, there's you know, the, the scarcity of oil and gas and certainly coal uh, are, is not sufficient to hold in check, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the ongoing emissions. In other words, um, if people continue to use oil and gas, there is enough oil and gas uh, to be found in the world, although it might be more ex expensive to extract and produce greater environmental impacts uh, through extraction. Um, but you know, if if we if we never changed and we just continue to grow our economy and our population uh, the way we have done, um, the uh, you know, that there's enough fossil fuel to support that, um, irrespective of the, the very severe consequences that might ensue uh, as a result of increased uh, greenhouse gas emissions. All right, so um, that's sort of an overview of energy sources and trends, and I'll, I'll talk more in detail about, about these each, each individual sources, but let's uh, make sure that we understand, um, you know, where we are in terms of um, hydrocarbons. So hydrocarbons, and this is this the discussion in the book. I think was uh, was pretty uh, uh, conclusive and pretty uh, uh, you know comprehensive. And so I'm not going to belabor uh, too much of what was said. You know, recall that the book pointed out that um, that most the reason we call uh, oil, gas, coal fossil fuels is because the um, the carbon that is uh, preserved in uh, coal, gas, oil, um, was extracted from the atmosphere um, by primary producers millions or hundreds of millions of years ago and then preserved in geologic uh, uh, formations, uh, deeply buried, and um, you know, that would otherwise have not returned to the, to the atmosphere. So uh, during the Jurassic age, you know, 150 million years ago, there was um, you know, very high levels of primary productivity. Um, that uh, organic carbon um, was not uh, recyclate, recirculated or recycled. Uh, a lot of that material was, uh, you know, was uh, preserved, was sequestered in uh, sediments, which eventually became geologic formations. And these geologic formations would have kept that fossil fuel locked up um, uh, essentially forever. Um, but uh, human beings came along and with technology and energy and demand and economies, um, we began removing that uh, fossil fuel. And so in, in, in my lifetime, you know, we have probably uh, returned to the atmosphere the amount of carbon that was sequestered during about 100 million years or even more of, of Earth history. So it's a kind of a staggering number to think about, you know, that the, the geologic uh, and Earth system ecological processes, you know, took uh, round numbers, 100 million years uh, to lock up a certain amount of carbon in these uh, reservoirs, lock it up by removing it from the atmosphere, essentially um, uh, you know, lowering the greenhouse effect in the total atmosphere, lowering the temperature of the planet, uh, and um, you know, as a consequence. But then, in you know, in, in this the space of you know less than a century, we return all that suddenly to the atmosphere. And if you just sort of think about you know the scale of, of processes and the scale of material transfer that takes place as a result of that. Um, you know, you can understand uh, just what a uh, dramatic impact uh, human beings have on the environment, and in particular, our energy uh, consumption uh, patterns have on um, on ecological you know, world environment. So, um, you know, what are hydrocarbons? Um, the simplest hydrocarbon is methane, uh, it's, uh, CH4, so one carbon uh, atom, four hydrogen atoms. Um, there's uh, liquid petroleum is a, another form of, um, uh, of hydrocarbons. Natural gas is a mixture of methane, the simplest plus more complex uh, hydrocarbons, uh, carbons that contain uh, multiple carbon uh, atoms. It's, and then uh, coal, and coal is an extremely complex hydrocarbon. Uh, it's a mixture of uh, uh, peat, lignite, bituminous, uh, anthracite coals. And, um, and you know, as I'll explain, um, uh, 
oil, liquid petroleum is produced from the fossilized material preserved from aquatic ecosystems. So lakes and uh, coastal ocean um, in the period when uh, these the carbon was being sequestered through those processes, the plants that were dying and being preserved were single cell algae living in aquatic environments, lakes, some rivers and estuaries, and primarily a shallow coastal oceans. And so oil derives from those, um, from the remains of those organisms. Coal, uh, on the other hand, is derived from um, macrophytes from uh, terrestrial plants, grasses, trees, shrubs um, that were preserved um, in, um, in, in sediments. Okay. So all hydrogen carbons share characteristics. They are readily oxidized. What do I mean by readily oxidized? You can burn them. And by burning them, you can release energy. Um, they're not consumable by higher organisms. So you can't eat coal or uh, oil, as everyone knows. Um, but bacteria are able to break down um, hydrocarbons. Um, chemically, the simplest hydrocarbon is methane. And uh, the formula for um, uh, alkanes is uh, um, uh, N, the CN. So the N is the number of um, uh, carbon uh, uh, atoms present. And uh, this would be CN, uh, hydrogen is present in two times the uh, N plus two. Um, so uh, if you think about um, methane, so that's one carbon molecule, and then um, two hydrogens plus two, so two times one plus two. And you can extract it up, so propane is uh, three carbon atoms, and so that's two times three plus two, eight hydrogen um, molecule. You can go all the way up, so propane, ethane, um, pentane, uh, there are hydrogen. So these are all um, uh, and, and these molecules uh, form together in chains, straight chains, and these are called uh, alkane chains. And so the gases, the hydrocarbon gases, uh, are hydrocarbons that um, uh, you know, obey this chemical uh, principle, chemical formula. And um, you know, the, the, uh, the simplest carbons are chains. You can also have zigzaggy chains with a series of these uh, uh, carbon uh, hydrogen groups. Um, however, if you get uh, six or more uh, uh, hydrocarbon groups, they can come together and form a ring. And the uh, uh, simplest example would be the benzene ring. Now these ringed compounds, unlike um, natural gas, are, can, can be extremely toxic. And um, so, um, and they're also, they're also known as aromatics. They have a distinct odor and then they're readily volatilized, readily evaporated into the atmosphere. And so when you go to the gas station and fill your car up and you notice the smell of the gasoline, well, what you're smelling are aromatic compounds that are evaporating coming off of the gasoline as you're pumping it into your car and you detect molecules of those uh, single ringed, of those ringed compounds uh, that are making their way through the air to your nostrils. And of course, um, to some degree or another being uh, potentially incorporated into your uh, tissues. So uh, benzenes uh, can you know, accumulate in uh, um, organism tissue over time, and they can have a number of deleterious effects, including carcinogenesis. Uh, oil and coal are enormously complex mixtures. So I've talked about very simple compounds, a straight chain, um, alkanes, methane, ethane, acetylene, propane, and so forth. So these are gaseous. Um, simple straight chain compounds. They can be ringed compounds um, where, they, where they join together in rings. But when you get coal and oil, it's not just these simple compounds. There's a, a, you know, a tremendous um, range of materials. And when I say a large range, here at Florida State University, we have the High Magnetic Field Laboratory, a National Science Foundation National Laboratory, world famous. And uh, they use magnetic, among the things that they do there are to use very, very high 
powered magnets to split apart um, oil and gas uh, into separate compounds so they can uh, determine more uh, accurately and more precisely um, what different kinds of oil, what different kinds of coal are made up of. And they do this for understanding better how to extract energy, how to avoid pollution, how to identify different sources uh, of oil and gas. Well, the, if, you, if you give uh, the high mag, the mag lab a, a sample of oil and they analyze it with their um, uh, uh, high-powered magnet uh, spectrometers, um, they typically produce as many as 300,000 to half a million distinct compounds present in a sample of oil. So when I say it's a highly complex mixture, you know, that should give you a measure of just how complex it is. So, um, you know, making useful products, you know, take means refining uh, and taking out um, you know, sort of screening out uh, different components of the, of the oil and gas, uh, which are less useful and leaving behind a purified product. So when you um, extract gasoline from um, uh, uh, crude oil, um, this is done through um, you know, by heating the material up essentially and distilling off um, uh, you know, components of the, of, the, of the mixture, of the heated mixture at different uh, states to leave behind, you know, these uh, complex compounds. Okay, so there's a, an overview of hydrocarbons. There's a heck of a lot, you know, there's, you know, books of material on, on hydrocarbons, but this is a, a brief um, uh, overview here. So what I want you to, to know, to take away from this, is this, um, you know, the, the uh, simple compounds, methane, ethane, these straight chain alkyne, alkane uh, um, uh, hydrocarbon compounds, which are the simplest sorts of hydrocarbons, um, benzene rings, which are these ringed compounds, um, you know, which have a, which also volatilize and which have um, uh, uh, health impacts. And then this understanding that uh, oil and gas, as they're extracted from the ground, are these incredibly complex um, mixtures of material and that uh, very often refining, particularly in the case of oil, is needed to um, produce uh, pure products that have specific sort of energy production uh, capabilities from those more complex mixtures. Okay, so carrying on. Um, you know, fossil fuels are formed when plant material is preserved, fossilized without being mineralized. Okay, what, what do I mean by that? You know, if you mineralize um, uh, or, uh, organic material, that means that it's converted from its um, uh, organic form into an inorganic form or and plus carbon dioxide plus water. Um, so when um, a hydrocarbon is, or an organic material is completely um, uh, consumed, all that's left are inert uh, uh, car carbon compounds. And an example of an inert carbon compound would be a calcium carbonate, for example, the material that uh, uh, shells and teeth and bones are made of. Well, this is not a material that can be, well, can be burned, um, but um, uh, it, it, you know, it's really not uh, labile. It's not available um, for, uh, to be consumed. And so, um, but fossil fuels occur when the plant material is preserved without being mineralized. And so um, uh, we've, we've seen these equations here before. So the formation of fossil fuels, um, you know, we can take these additional processes. Um, uh, so you, if you, if you um, uh, bury organic material, um, bacteria and yeasts and microbes can continue to utilize it over time. Um, and um, so, and this process of, of utilizing um, um, organic material by bacteria uh, can include uh, methanogenesis. So methane can be generated as a, uh, a process of um, you know, consuming uh, organic compounds through microbial activity. So methanogenesis, producing um, this simple carbon compound as a, as a waste product of um, you know, fossil of, uh, of organic carbon consumption uh, is very much a component of the uh, long-term carbon cycle. Is that clear? 
um, uh, you know, you understand what I'm saying here is that you, you know, as you as you bury um, uh, organic material and as it's being transformed by microbial activity, you know, you get away from the the uh, heterotrophic uh, consumption, you know, with just mixing oxygen, and um, uh, you know, it, it takes more sort of uh, complex uh, uh, forms. And so fermentation, uh, for example, taking a simple sugar and producing, um, you know, uh, compounds. And then, you know, then the next series of bacteria um, could consume these compounds um, with the production of, of uh, small components or small amounts of um, natural gas, methane in, in the process. Okay, so um, you know, let's look at. I'm uh, talking about burying organic material, and, and, and you know what happens here. Um, so you know, an early source of fossil fuel for human beings were peat bogs, and what peat bogs are are a present day analog of the kind of environment that would have existed, um, you know, 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago, sort of a productive swamp-like uh, ecosystem where there were high rates of plant growth and production. Um, the material, the plants and the woody material would um, die, um, sink into um, uh, wet sediments, um, be preserved without oxygen, uh, and sort of be transitioned over time into fossil fuels. So uh, peat forms when plant debris builds up under uh, low oxygen conditions, such as are found in wetlands. And um, over time, this peat can be dug up, dried, and burned as fuel. And uh, these, these pictures are taken from uh, Ireland. Uh, and uh, this is a sort of a traditional, used to be a traditional form of, um, uh, of uh, sort of fuel production uh, in that country. Uh, in fact, I remember touring Ireland uh, many, many years ago and there was actually a, a peat fired um, uh, uh, power generation plant. So they were actually digging up peat and using it as a source of fuel uh, to produce electricity. Well, that has been, I'm sure, phased out many years ago uh, because this uh, burning this uh, simple uh, or this uh, uh, poorly preserved um, amount of organic carbon reduces tremendous amounts of uh, CO2 and other pollutants into the atmosphere. In other words, when you burn this, you can, you can burn the carbon, um, the organic carbon material, um, but all of the extra material that's mixed in with this is then released into the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, so there are high rates, high rates of, of uh, not only uh, carbon dioxide production, uh, but also sulfur compounds that are released. So, um, you know, these sorts of simple fuels uh, like peat and like coal uh, tend to produce a lot of pollution. All right. So, um, you know, we start with producing um, uh, uh, peat and, you know, sort of plant material preserved in a low oxygen wet environment. Uh, and then if we sort of track that back through time, um, so we're going deeper and deeper into the, the, the uh, layers here. So if we start with um, uh, organic material preserved in a swamp environment and en envision a, you know, a layer of sediment and, and preserved carbon that's you know, say five meters thick, as this gets buried uh, deeper and deeper, uh, sediments accumulate on top of it, the uh, organic material is subject to pressure and heat um, and this transforms the, um, the organic material into a more purified form of carbon, um, but a carbon that still retains large amounts of, uh, of other impurities. So the first kind of um, carbon to form from this would be brown coal. Um, and brown coal uh, is, a, is a form of coal which is used for um, you know, energy production, uh, for, uh, energy generation. Um, the next uh, kind of coal, which is sort of purer than brown coal would be lignite or bituminous coal. Uh, and so brown coal is, uh, you know, is what they produce in Montana, uh, uh, Wyoming. I know this is a, an area where there's lots of uh, uh, brown coal. Burning it produces, uh, releases a lot of uh, carbon dioxide and other material. Lignite or bituminous coal is also used as a, as a fuel source. 
Um, and then the, the, the most uh, rarefied and refined uh, form of coal is what's called anthracite coal. Anthracite coal um, is also called metallurgenous coal uh, because it's a very pure form and it's used, it's burned uh, in the production and the heat from uh, burning anthracite coal is used for the production of uh, steel. And so um, it's no coincidence that the uh, steel mills uh, of Pennsylvania were located near the uh, anthracite coal mines uh, because there was an abundant supply of this uh, metallurgenous uh, coal, a coal that could be burned at a very high heat um, to produce, um, you know, to produce the kinds of changes needed to in, in, in steel production. And again, most of the coal that we have was formed not 150 million years ago, but 300 million years ago uh, during the so-called uh, Carboniferous era. And uh, as the uh, name implies, this was a time when there was um, you know, abundant uh, primary production. And you know, so we're looking at uh, 300 million year old uh, fossil fuels that are extracted and burned. And that's part of this incredible um, you know, a process of returning uh, fossil fuel into the environment, into the atmosphere over very short periods of, of time. Okay, well, where do we find uh, coal resources in the United States? I sort of hinted at that. Um, you know, this is the medium high uh, subbituminous coal, uh, anthracite coal production. This is Pennsylvania. This is what I was talking about here um, and uh, other parts of the Eastern seaboard. So this is very old, very deeply buried uh, coal that's been transformed to this. And then uh, brown coal, um, you know, um, uh, you know, lignite uh, are prevalent across, you know, uh, large portions of the Intermountain West in the in continental U.S. And so, using this coal for power, to, power generation releases sulfur to the atmosphere. Um, and uh, you know, you can also see sort of the um, uh, you know the ranking of these coals in terms of energy content. Um, you know, energy content millions of joules per kilogram, uh, and you can see that the anthracite coal uh, has a much higher energy con uh, content than uh, lignite or subbituminous bituminous coal. Uh, and also a lower sulfur compound. So um, um, the cuminous coal, which is you know, widely used for power generation, also has a high sulfur content, uh, uh, content and that can be a factor in uh, air pollution as well as uh, CO2 production. So how did we uh, mine coal? Where does coal mining come from? And this, this is a sort of an important sort of history to understand, you know, the classic coal mining, you know, as was practiced in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania and other um, uh, West Virginia, sort of what we think of when we think of coal miners, uh, we talk about coal miners as being sort of an essential American um, workforce. So the classic coal mining was what's called shaft and seam mining. So from the surface, the, um, the miners would dig these um, you know, very, very deep shafts. And these are you know, uh, tunnels that you know, 20 or 30 um, uh, feet wide. Uh, and then they would lower um, uh, um, uh, elevators would be lowered down and at different levels in the shaft, they would branch off with tunnels. And the, pers the, pers the uh, objective of the tunnel was to intersect these layers uh, of coal. Uh, and so um, this is a big, you know, expensive uh, proposition. Uh, you're having to, you know, dig down. Uh, and initially the, the tunnel uh, boring was done by, you know, uh, human labor, uh, drilling and blasting, so drilling into these layers um, with uh, you know, high power drills, and then packing the holes that they drilled with, um, with uh, explosives, detonating the explosives, coming back and, and, and you know, returning the material, including uh, the coal, sort of separating the coal out, um, putting it in um, uh, you know, trains that would then return it to the surface. So great big industrial uh, um, practice. Well, this uh, shaft and seam coal mining uh, is really a thing of the past. Uh, that's, you know, really not the way uh, modern uh, coal mining occurs. Most of the coal mining that's practiced in the United States uh, uses other methods. And um, one of the principal methods is what's called strip mining. And so uh, strip mining 
is um, uh, you know, not digging individual shafts that descend into the uh, geologic layers, but simply removing uh, large uh, uh, fractions of the overburdened sediments. And so this is done with you know, gigantic um, uh, shovels. Uh, so what you can see here in this picture is a, is a shovel and you could probably put, fit you know, five dump trucks into this uh, shovel here. So they're really giant things. And they're you know, uh, lifted up with these uh, booms and uh, positioned and then crawl back um, to scrape away the surface material. And the objective of that is to scrape away the surface material until you get to these uh, coal seams. And then um, instead of having to drill a hole and you know, bore with expensive boring machines and you know, oil, oil, oil material back up to the surface, you can simply, or the coal miners can simply extract the material directly uh, and move it into production. So um, removal of the overburden with drag line shovel exposed the coal seams. Okay, well, you know, keeping in mind the diagram that I showed you earlier of the, um, uh, you know, how deeply buried um, the material is, you can understand that uh, strip mining and uh, other forms of, uh, of surface mining, um, you know, are tending to attack or uh, tending to remove coal um, that's relatively young in geologic age. In other words, uh, strip mining um, and another form of strip mining is what's called mountaintop removal. So in this case, the entire tops of, you know, mountains or or large hills are carried away um, and uh, to expose you know, large seams uh, of coal. But these coals, because they're not very deeply, are the ones that have the highest sulfur compound content and release the most CO2. And of course, once you've removed um, a mountaintop, you have to do something with that um, uh, overburden. And the typical form of uh, uh, disposal from a mountaintop removal is to take the mountaintop and dump it into the adjacent uh, valley or stream bed um, that's flowing past. And so, you know, one of the huge impacts of mountaintop removal uh, is the burial then of uh, water sources and, and watershed um, uh, courses. So mountaintops are removed and then typically dumped into uh, 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 adjacent uh, uh, watershed valleys. So that has the, um, a huge uh, environmental impact. Well, you know, a lot of the regulatory uh, disputes and conflicts around coal mining have to do with um, how, um, you know, to dispose of these tailings uh, or material. Um, and they are, you know, for a while, mountaintop removal, they were forbidden from, um, uh, by regulation from uh, you know, dropping their tailings into stream beds. And more recently, those policies have been reversed by executive order. So it's now permissible uh, to remove, you know, material and dump it into stream beds. Um, but none of this, you know, so, you know, that's, that's going on. Um, where are we? So, you know, overburden is deemed to be dumped into adjacent valleys. So in 1989, um, uh, court order ruled that mining debris could not be dumped into rivers. And the uh, stream protection tool was a federal regulation. Um, and it went into effect on uh, January 19th, 2017. So one of the first things that the, the new administration did was to rescind this, uh, this order that mining debris could not be dumped into rivers. And this was done under the so-called stream protection rule. Um, and um, um, Uh, so the stream protection rule was, was enacted on, on January 19th, and by February, uh, President Trump had rescinded that rule. Um, this has been argued back and forth in, in the courts. I believe most recently the courts upheld uh, President Trump's uh, um, uh, rescinding of that rule. Um, so these, uh, these, uh, these things have you know, local impacts, environmental impacts, but for people who live in this region, uh, these, these impacts can be very severe. So, you know, that's a brief history of, of coal mining. Um, and uh, um, you know, so we've understood that coal is a preserved form of organic material produced by terrestrial plants. Um, and uh, these plants are buried uh, under layers, stratigraphic layers, 
They're transformed by uh, the pressure and heat of burial uh, into these um, compact uh, energy, high energy compact uh, 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 materials, uh, which can be extracted and burned. And uh, the extraction and burning process um, has uh, environmental impacts. All right, let's carry on and look at the oil, the oil and gas uh, formation under marine conditions. So the formation of a pool of oil and gas under uh, requires a, a whole range of conditions. So there has to be a burial of, a, of an organic source material. Now, as I said from the, at the outset, the source material, the organic source material that's used to produce um, oil is different, fundamentally different from that of used to produce coal. Now, these are single cell aquatic organisms that are buried under um, you know, conditions of uh, you know, high productivity. So um, it has to be buried quite deeply. So these uh, or, or organisms die, they sink to the bottom of the uh, lake or, or ocean, uh, and then they're buried under you know, um, you know, an accumulation of subsequent sediments. The burial has to be pretty deep. So um, ideally, the, the, this organic material is buried between two to six kilometers uh, uh, you know, under, you know, sediments, two to six kilometers of sediments accumulate on top of these layers of, of organic material. Uh, and the temperature of burial is somewhere in the range of 60 to 160 degrees Celsius. So, you know, pretty warm or hot, um, but not severe, not, you know, um, you know, very hot. And this is critical because if the temperature actually starts to exceed 160 degrees, so like 200 degrees Celsius, which is certainly attainable uh, in, in, in sub-bottom conditions, um, the hydrocarbons start to burn away. And so, um, you know, there's uh, what's called the oil formation window. So this is the window. So it has to be buried. It has to be high temperature, but not too high. And if that temperature is buried, if the material is buried more deeply, uh, if the temperature starts exceeding this, uh, this critical factor, then the oil window is passed in time. So formation of, of, uh, of oil and gas um, from or, uh, organic material derived from single cell organisms, aquatic organisms, uh, you know, occurs within this relatively narrow range of materials. Okay, so that generates the oil. Um, but once it's generated, oil and gas is a lighter, you know, less dense than the surrounding sediments, and it starts to move, starts to try to migrate out of the stratigraphic position within it, which is generated. So it has to be uh, confined into some kind of um, uh, reservoir or trap where it can be contained until uh, it's extracted for energy production. So, um, you know, petroleum production is a form of mining that pumps oil and gas from reservoirs below the surface. And so, you know, we talked about the uh, shale source rock. So this is the organic layer within the oil production window where the, uh, you know, where oil and gas were cooked from the uh, organic material. Well, then it migrates out of this source area and up into younger sediments. To produce an economic reservoir of oil or gas, you have to have um, the source rock, and you have to have a rock um, type that is uh, highly porous, where the oil and gas, um, liquid and gas, uh, can accumulate in the pore spaces within the rock. So examples of, of, of reservoir rock would include reefs, uh, gravel at the mouths of rivers, um, uh, various uh, uh, types of, uh, of, of sedimentary rocks that are you know, characterized by high porosity, uh, large porous spaces. And so the oil and gas can accumulate within the pore spaces of that kind of rock. Well, uh, and then you need a third type of rock, which is some sort of an impervious layer uh, that keeps the oil and gas trapped within that um, reservoir. And, you know, so these kinds of conditions can produce under a variety of geologic conditions. Uh, the most um, um, uh, common form uh, is what's called an anticlinal um, uh, uh, formation. And an anticlinal formation, the uh, movement of the uh, tectonic layers uh, produces this um, a bulge 
in the uh, sedimentary layer. So these are all layers, formations that were laid down at you know, roughly the same time. And then deformation of the crustal material uh, forms a anticline, a mound. And then within this anticline, you can get a um, uh, traps where oil and gas accumulate underneath impervious layers. Okay, and so it can be extracted. Well, um, let's see, I'm gonna jump ahead here. So this, this is occurring, so you produce this oil and gas, and the crude oil that's produced from these platforms uh, is typically um, in, one, in a different place from where it's needed for uh, refining and uh, consumption. So the crude oil has to be transported uh, to, to refinery facilities and processed to yield gasoline, heating oil, and other products. So transportation of the oil produced in these uh, localized areas uh, is a, an essential part of the um, um, reliance on oil and gas uh, as an energy source. And so <laughs> transportation of oil and gas is a, is a typical, is an important component here. Well, that transportation <coughs> means that um, huge amounts of oil are moving around, and this is happening all the time, uh, by ship. And so, um, you know, there was a shock to the system in uh, 1989 when the Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound, Alaska. I don't think there are any of you that were alive um, during that uh, time, uh, but I was. And I can recall just how shocking it was to see this pristine Alaska wilderness, beautiful coastal area, uh, suddenly impacted by the oil uh, that was released from the Exxon Valdez. So the Exxon Valdez, uh, you know, you probably know the history. The, the captain uh, was drunk and he went to sleep and left an inexperienced uh, third mate at the wheel. The third mate got confused as he was trying to come out of, uh, so he was going through this, um, this region here. Um, the, uh, and uh, he got confused about his route and drove the ship onto uh, uh, rocks, uh, onto a reef. And then um, they tried to move it off and they ripped out the bottom and they released um, uh, something like uh, 10 million gallons of oil. Um, somewhere between 10 and 25 million gallons of oil, actually. But the official number was, was 10 million gallons of oil. This was a very heavy, thick oil that floated on the surface and went ashore along this, this wide area of, um, of pristine, otherwise pristine uh, wilderness. Um, so the, actually, I, I had a little disoriented. The, the, the ship was coming out of um, uh, Valdez, Alaska here and then proceeding through here and it ran ashore on Bly Reef uh, and then the oil spill um, it was moved by the currents and the wind uh, to the coastline, um, you know, many, many miles away. So 500 miles away, uh, you still had oiling from the, from the Exxon Valdez spill. So this was a huge shock um, and, uh, you know, really sort of required you know, an occasion to a major rethinking of the regulation that, uh, that we use to protect oil and gas. So this occurred in 1989, March 24th of 1989. And by the next year, you know, less than a year after that, Congress had passed the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, OPA 90, uh, that's called or OPA 1990. So this was a, a sweeping set of regulation. Um, you know, that affected you know, primarily transportation of oil. So oil tankers were required to have double hulls uh, to protect them so that, if, you know, if, if this, if the Valdez, Exxon Valdez ship had a double hull, uh, much less oil would have been re released. And so that regulation, you know, was applied and became applied worldwide. And this happened very, very quickly. Um, and so that was a you know, uh, fast forward to the BP oil spill of 2010, so 10 years ago, and we still have had nothing like uh, the kind of um, uh, legislation that was produced within one year. So we live in a different um, uh, political era than, uh, than it was in the 1990s. Okay, um, I'll drop some reservoirs I've already talked about. <clears throat> uh, but the um, because these traps and reservoirs <clears throat> Uh, are located because the source material is, is produced in, in shallow coastal seas, um, the uh, ocean margins 
uh, both uh, on land and offshore, are good places to look for oil and gas. And the modern era of oil production um, began along the Texas coast, uh, a place called Spindletop, um, where one of these anticlinal formations was drilled and produced the classic Texas gusher. Um, that was in 1905. And the um, uh, you know, that was the sort of the beginning of the modern era of oil production. So Texas and Spindletop and uh, production of oil at the water's edge, uh, you know, is very much at the core and the root of the history of, of oil usage. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about oil, offshore oil production, uh, offshore energy platforms. And so, um, you know, the, the initial through from about 1905 through about uh, 1945 or so, all the oil production was 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 on land. So the, the wells were drilled and the, um, the the derricks and the production of, occurred right on the land. Starting in about 1947, uh, the oil companies realized that they could move offshore and they could tap into reservoirs that were under the uh, the water in the present day. And so uh, the, some of the first structures are sort of wooden platforms that were built uh, you know, very close to the shore. And then gradually over time, you know, as the closer the, the uh, reservoirs that were closest to land began to be used up, the, and technology developed and capabilities and demand continued, the, there was a sort of a steady progression into deeper and deeper waters. And this uh, cartoon illustrates um, that progression. So initially, we start with platforms that are anchored to the bottom. Um, that go up through, you know, 100 meters or more of the water column. And then there's a production facility which is sitting on top of that platform. You recall that the particular picture I showed you in the beginning was this jack-up rig um, with legs. And so these are, these are forms of nearshore energy production platforms. <clears throat> and, you know, that kind of platform was, um, you know, was installed, you know, through the 1980s, you know, was sort of the era of that. Uh, and then in the late 1980s, um, you know, they began producing water and producing uh, oil and gas from much deeper um, systems. And so it was no longer possible to build uh, platforms uh, that could, you know, have legs that extended all the way uh, from the platform deck all the way to the bottom. And, and so they had to come up with different methods of anchoring on um, the system. And so um, what's being shown here is a drilling rig and I want to distinguish between a production platform and a drilling rig. A production platform is a more or less permanent uh, facility, uh, which is uh, constructed and set in place uh, over a, a reservoir. And there are typically multiple wells that go down from this platform and go down thousands and thousands of feet below the bottom uh, to find the individual reservoirs. Um, but in the initial stages of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, discovering and, and establishing one of these oil fields, it's necessary to drill exploration wells. And these exploration wells are drilled by um, uh, 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 drilling rigs. Right. So let me, you know, so let me finish the thought here about, you know, the progression here. So you have these offshore, um, nearshore uh, platforms that have legs that extend to the bottom. And then as we move into deeper water, you know, 500 meters, 1,000 meters, 1,500 meters of water, um, it, they, they develop a system where there's a floating uh, production facility and uh, which is anchored. And so this is the most common, this is what's called a tension leg platform. And so this is a platform that's actually floating and the flotation is provided by these huge um, empty cylinders. So these are uh, giant holes, giant um, empty uh, steel uh, tubes and um, they, they displace enough water so that the whole platform is able to float on that. And then from these, uh, from these, uh, tanks or from these uh, pontoons, there are uh, uh, cables that go down to, the, to anchors, anchor arrays on the bottom. And so the whole system floats. And so um, <clears throat> the, the, the first, one of the first uh, 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 tension lake platforms was installed in about 500 meters of water. And for reference, the, there are now uh, energy production platforms, tension leg platforms in as much as 2,000 meters of water. 
All these platforms are located in a single area, but because drilling is allowed to, is able to go in horizontal directions, the reservoirs that are being produced um, by a platform can be literally miles away from the location. So the well, the, the, um, the, the wells go out uh, laterally from the source. Okay, so that's the progression. And, and in the modern era, there's very little uh, nearshore production that happens. All of the all of the production, certainly in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it takes place in very deep water. And so these platforms are extremely expensive. They, you know, starting price for a modern uh, offshore uh, energy production is, you know, $500 million to a billion dollars uh, needed to, to establish one of these things. Um, so uh, these are huge enterprises, you know, very capital intensive, um, but they're able to tap into uh, uh, reservoirs that contain, you know, a billion barrels or more. Um, so very, very high stakes in terms of the economic effects. All right, well, like, so that's the progression here, but let me return to this, um, uh, drilling platform I issue because you know that's uh, very much uh, the, the the impact to the environment uh, that we've seen has been very much by these drilling platforms. So the drilling platform, the idea of a drilling platform is that you have a a movable um, uh, ship essentially, so a very large ship with all of the the drilling capacity and the pipes and all of the you know helidex and you know personnel uh, space. Uh, you know, shops and everything. That's all in a very large ship. And you can see here that you know, these could be, you know, um, you know, as much as 300 feet long. Uh, so this is a very large floating facility and it's anchored uh, to the bottom by an array of anchor lines that go out. So if you're going to explore for well, uh, explore for uh, an offshore energy well, you'd have a have located um, your oil company geologists would locate a likely prospect. One of these uh, drilling platforms would be uh, commissioned, typically rented from another uh, operator, and then uh, either drive under its own power or be towed into position. And then this array of anchors would be put out, and the um, uh, you know drilling would uh, would commence. So they'd lower all this down to the, the drill stem and then start drilling into the bottom. Well, I'll be talking about the potential environmental impact. The first thing to think about is the mechanical impact of these chains that go down. And so these um, uh, platforms, uh, drilling platforms are, are anchored to the bottom. This is, they have to be anchored to the bottom by these massive um, uh, uh, chains. And so there's typically uh, six to 10 uh, chains that go out, anchor chains that go out in all directions to keep the drilling platform stable in, in place and to prevent it being moved around by storms and so forth. So in order to, in order to um, uh, anchor one of these platforms, these chains have to be um, spread out and typically they're spread, you know, carried a, you know, a kilometer or more from the source so that there's a very long angle. So there's a hanging chain, ank there's a giant anchor, and then there's a, a chain across the bottom. So that's all very well and good, um, but you can think about the impact that these massive chains have on seafloor life, uh, including deep sea corals, chemosynthetic communities, and others. So uh, both in the process of putting the, the anchors out and then retrieving them, the um, uh, it's it's uh, you know this uh, operation can cause uh, you know very major impacts. And so here's a, a picture from. Uh, a court case that I was involved with uh, some years ago, where we were looking at the impact of, uh, of anchor chains on the bottom. And here is a trench that was formed by an anchor chain. And you can see that it's passing, you know, right through the middle of this um, uh, coral, deep sea coral community. It's kind of a, um, this is a frame grab from a video, so it's not terribly clear, um, but that was the impact that this, uh, that this had. And so, you know, one of the potential marine environmental impacts of offshore drilling is just the mechanical impact uh, from putting one of these uh, drill platforms out. Well, how many of these things are there? Well, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of test wells that have been drilled. And so all of them are potentially associated with these, um, these damages. And the, although uh, the regulations state that you have to be careful about where you position uh, wells and where you position uh, impacts, you know, there's less attention paid to the, to the drag marks uh, you know, created by, these, um, uh, by the drill platforms.
So that's one uh, potential in, environmental impact from offshore energy drilling. Um, and you know, this gives you a sort of sense of you know, some of the, the scale here. And so this is a picture from SkyTruth. Uh, SkyTruth is a uh, environmentalist organization that uses uh, satellite data and other public information to look for uh, environmental impacts. And so here we have a picture of all of the platforms. Now this is actually a fraction of the platforms. There's about 4,000 uh, platforms in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And they're all connected or most of them are connected with pipelines. And so these pipelines have to be run across the bottom um, to the sites there. And you can see that there's been a progression into deeper and deeper water. Um, you know, this is this uh, shelf here marks about the 200 meter uh, depth uh, level. And then when you get down to these outer here, this is about, uh, the depth here is about 3000 uh, meters. So this is a uh, 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 Knoll here. No, this, this is a uh, Green Knoll. And um, uh, you can see that there are uh, platforms and pipelines installed. So the uh, impact of, you know, uh, 100 years, 100 plus years of energy production over time, you know, has been very significant and very widespread. And just for reference, the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spell was started in this location here. It's about 100 miles from um, uh, Mississippi uh, River Delta. And uh, Mariner Energy, Vermilion 380 was another oil spill. Um, uh, you know, that, that occurred uh, as a result of a production uh, platform that had a, an accident. Okay, um, and then, uh, so we got a few minutes left. Let me just talk about the uh, Macondo well. Um, so this was um, the uh, BP spill. And so this gives you a sense of sort of the scale of things that are involved in these ultra deep uh, uh, production platforms. So the drill platform, the drilling platform, um, and the drilling rig was of course the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig. So that was a floating ship that was under able to drive on its own power. And it, so it drove to a location um, designated as uh, Mississippi Canyon 252 as I showed you on the map, the water depth there was 150, uh, 1,500 meters, so about a mile deep. And from that point a mile deep, they drilled an additional uh, 4,100 meters into the, into the sediments to uh, reach the Macondo Prospect, the Macondo Reservoir. Um, the material that they were drilling through uh, was very uh, rocky, uh, contained, you know, churts and, and flints and, you know, other sort of very hard rock material. So as they were drilling, they, they had a number of different um, uh, accidents and uh, costly delays. And so they were months behind schedule and millions of dollars uh, uh, over budget um, when they eventually uh, uh, struck oil uh, at the bottom of this platform. And you know what you're seeing here is sort of a diagram of the, um, the, 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 the uh, well casing that was installed as they went. So initially they drill a hole and then they come back and they, you know, as they get deeper and deeper on this, they, um, the uh, pipe gets smaller and smaller. So at the surface, we're looking at a pipe that's, you know, roughly 36 inches in diameter. And uh, then we get to the bottom, we have a pipe that's only seven inches in diameter. And this, um, uh, at this depth, you know, 1,500, 5,600 meters below sea level, uh, they struck oil, the Macondo uh, Prospect. And this was a, a fabulously uh, productive um, uh, oil reservoir that they found. The oil was a light, sweet crude. It contained relatively few uh, compounds. It was very, very gassy. Uh, so they were very excited uh, to have been very pleased to have uh, found this, in fact. And when they announced that they had found this, the BP uh, stock prices uh, shot up. And so um, the, uh, uh, I just have a few minutes left here. So uh, essentially, they made this decision to um, instead of uh, typically what they do when they find oil in one of these exploration wells is they say, okay, we know there's oil and gas there. Uh, let's come back with the production platform and then we'll be able to drill new wells. And so to make sure that there are no accidents or anything in the entertainment, the well is that the discovery well is filled with cement from top to bottom to kill it off so that nothing can come out. And then later 
the production platform was installed at the site and they drill new wells. Well, they had spent so much money uh, drilling this well that they made the economic choice that instead of plugging it completely, they would just put a small plug at the bottom. Um, you know, but so instead of plugging all uh, 4,000 meters of, of sediment, they, they made a little plug that was about 200, 250 feet long uh, of cement at the very, very bottom of this. And they said, okay, well, that's all we need to do. We'll just plug that up and then we'll abandon this well. And then when we come back, we can drill out that little plug and we'll have a, a, a well into this uh, into this uh, very high producing uh, reservoir and we won't have to spend the money of drilling a brand new well. So that was the decision that they made. Um, and um, so uh, unfortunately that cement plug didn't hold. And it was, a, you know, it was actually an untried technology. Nobody had really done that before. And they were drilling into a, into a reservoir that was very, very pressurized and there were very high pressures. And so when that plug failed, um, you know, oil and gas came shooting up this um, cable all the way down from you know, 4,000 meters um, below the, 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 the sea bottom all the way up towards the surface. Well, let's think about that. So oil and gas um, you know, is under very high pressure. As it goes upward, the pressure decreases, the oil and gas expands, and that causes the uh, material to move even more quickly. And so there's this giant feedback loop. And by the time the oil and gas um, you know, reach the, the seafloor, it's essentially a cannon shot going off. So that's what happened um, you know, at uh, uh, like one in the morning on the 19th of April, 2010, the, the plug failed. Uh, and the oil and gas came shooting up, exploded, uh, and um, uh, you know, caused the, the, the oil spill. Um, this was supposed to have been prevented by something called a blowout preventer. This is a giant uh, contraption that sits on the bottom. It's hydraulically powered. It's supposed to be you know, dead man switch, fail safe, you know, multiple systems. All the systems failed. There's supposed to be something called a blind shear ram here. And this is supposed to, these are giant jaws that are supposed to pinch shut and, and cut this thing off. Um, and, uh, um, you know, but they failed. The batteries hadn't been changed. And this thing uh, essentially was a giant, very expensive uh, piece of garbage that didn't work on the bottom. And then the result was a, uh, an oil spill. So this is not, um, if this is not what occurred, you know, right at, on, in uh, April 20th. This picture was taken in, um, in uh, June, uh, the early June, and they had cut away uh, the, the overlying pipes so they could access the material. So this is the oil and gas coming out of the Macondo well. All right, I'm going to stop there. We'll talk more about um, uh, other systems when we get to the end. And I guess I went a little over time. Uh, are there any questions? No questions. Do these reservoirs constantly produce or do, is there, is there a point in time where you've just sucked it dry and then you have to move on? Yeah, good question. So um, the, the, um, the, the thing that I showed you before, the, the pump jack here. So this is the sort of classic picture, right? What is this? This is a pump. And so, um, you know, the oil and gas is, you know, is deep down in the bottom and this piston goes up and down and each time it pulls up, it pulls out, you know, like acts like a pump and it sucks a little bit of oil and gas out of the reservoir. Well, that represents a reservoir which is not self-producing. There's not enough pressure uh, in the reservoir um, to allow the oil to get out. It has to be pumped out actively. Um, when you drill, you know, the blowout kind of scenario that you have where you drill in and all of a sudden the giant Texas gusher is coming out, that's from a reservoir which is full of gas and oil, and there's enough pressure in that reservoir to drive the oil out actively. So in the first stages of discovery, a, a new reservoir would produce on its own, uh, and then over time, um, it would be necessary to eventually pump it out. So when they uh, drilled into the Macondo Reservoir, this was a reservoir that had been, you know, the, 
locked up for you know 100 million years or more. And there were huge amounts of gas, huge amounts of oil under extreme pressure. Uh, and so um, you know there was enough drive in that system to allow the oil and gas to pump out. And you know if nobody had plugged that up, um, you know it's impossible to say how long um, such a system would continue to leak oil. Um, you know, there are examples of, uh, of oil and gas reservoirs that have been flowing under their own power for, you know, decades. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if, if the Macondo Reservoir had been breached and then not plugged, yeah, that we probably, we would still uh, have oil uh, spilling into the Gulf and oil and gas spilling into the Gulf at, you know, a rate of tens of thousands of barrels per day. Uh, Carrie will be talking about uh, a different example of that. And so uh, she'll be offering some, uh, some, some data to show how this takes place. Okay, other okay. questions? All right, well, I realize I didn't leave any time for a discussion, but there's a lot of material that I wanna cover. This is um, information that's sort of close to the area of research that I do. So I'm you know, trying to share with you uh, experiences that I've had and, and you know, about this very important issue. So, all right, uh, we'll see you on- uh... I have a little oh, question. Sure, go ahead. It's just quick, it's, I mean, I feel like it's related, um, but um, I don't know if you have a Twitter, but um, recently I saw a video of, I think it's called an oil tanker off the coast of um, like Trinidad. Yeah. So I guess, um, have you heard about that? Is there a spill off Trinidad? No, um, I guess one of their um, oil tankers is on, is like close to being tipped over. Oh. And I guess like the fishermen and stuff were just um, kind of publicizing it on like social media and stuff to kind of draw attention to it. But um, yeah, I, I guess- I have not heard about that. Um, that's okay. an interesting thing that happens a lot, you know, that the, the mm -hmm. you know, transportation accidents. So, I, you know, one of the things I'm trying to distinguish between is sort of accidents that occur as they transport oil uh, all over the world, and they can ha they can happen anywhere. Um, so, you know, Trinidad actually does have oil production, um, but you know, every country uses oil, and to get that oil to that country, typically it comes in tanks, tanker ships, and those ships are subject to marine accidents. Um, and so that is one source of uh, oil spill. The, you know, the sort of blowouts from production platforms, those are rarer. Um, they are occurring more frequently in the present day because of the challenges and, and dangers of you know, producing really, really deep water. So thank you for bringing that you know, up. I, I, I don't have Twitter. Um, uh, uh, I, I, perhaps I should have Twitter, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of people just share a lot of um, like current issues, especially nowadays um, on Twitter. But I just thought it was interesting because it talked about how there was a threat of like 1.3 million barrels of, barrels of oil um, mm -hmm. like being dumped to the ocean. So yeah, but okay. <laughs> I have a question. Sure, no, 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 yeah, Berta, go ahead. Oh, um, it was just about the deep water horizon spill, how uh -huh. it was, how you just said that it was in deep, in deep water right. and how they're very like, um, apparently really, really bad for the environment, obviously. Is it, is there any difference in as to why deep water is worse for oil spills than surface spills? Is it because of the spread? Like, is it the currents or is it just because oil obviously is, would float on top of surface water versus yeah, well, uh, yeah you, you know, there is a real difference in the, first of all, if you, if you have a tanker, you know, um, so like the Exxon Valdez, for example, um, that was, uh, that ran ashore on the reef, it released oil from, I think, one of or two of six different separate tanks, um, and the other tanks were, were not uh, damaged, and so most of the oil was was kept on board the the ship. They actually towed it down. So if you if a if a tanker um, is damaged or sinks or you know otherwise has an accident, the amount of oil that can be released is limited to the amount of oil in the ship. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be bad. It can happen close to shore. The oil can go into you know into uh, vulnerable coastal ecosystems, um, but at least you know, it, it, there's a limit to it. 
uh, in the case of these uh, um, you know, loss of well control, that's sort of a general term for describing accidents that can occur in deep water, there's no such limit. Um, the oil will flow uh, as long as um, the, the opening you know, extends from the surface down the wells into the platform. And you'll see when in, um, in Kerry's presentation on Thursday, that there was an oil a, a platform that was damaged as a result of a hurricane. It began leaking oil and has been leaking oil for uh, 15 years. Um, so, you know, there's really sort of no built in limit uh, when one of these deep water uh, uh, platforms is, is breached. And of course, if it's at the bottom of the ocean, it's very difficult to access. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the wreckage and, and to plug things off because you're working, you know, at the, at the limits of, uh, you know, human uh, engineering. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? My question is going to be maybe a little bit, bit longer, but I just wanted to ask if, since these methods are clearly more environmental, have a more environmental impact than natural and renewable sources of energy. Do you truly see a change happening anytime soon? Because I have the graph in mind that you mentioned, if the change was immediate, you know, CO2 emissions would go low very fast and all that. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering, what's, do you see an outlook on that or what is it your outlook? Um. Well, you know, I think that the challenges uh, of climate change and, you know, which are overwhelmingly a result of fossil fuel con consumption and in particular oil consumption, that there's so much that's sort of baked in that we're going to be facing, you know, severe challenges. Even if we stopped today, um, we still have, you know, climate change, you know, that's, that's part, of the, part of the system. Um, but it, you know, what we can do in the next 10 years is really, you know, a, um, um, you know, it's really kind of up in the air. And, you know, we can see in this country that there is a distinct choice, um, you know, in this election. So um, you've got, it couldn't be more clear. You've got one candidate that says we have to transition in a way and another candidate that says no, um, you know, our, our economy, our way of life depends on, you know, this, you know, continuing to consume energy that we get from these sources. So I do feel, a, you know, sort of a hopefulness around the prospects of transitioning. I think that, you know, that the, the economic incentives and the societal incentives are kind of undervalued. Um, you know, we sort of think that, oh, well, um, you know, economics and, and you know, basic demand is just going to continue to drive things. But, you know, if we look at the specific example of the coal industry, for example, um, so, you know, coal is a part of power generation, but a combination of regulation, um, you know, being able economically to replace coal with less expensive, less polluting natural gas, uh, and, you know, societal pressures, um, you know, have really sort of turned the corner on coal. We're not going to go back in this country anyway uh, to coal generation. Um, but, you know, we're, we're in the enviable position of having natural sources and, you know, being able to begin transitioning to, to um, renewables. In the developing world, you know, in Africa, Asia, um, India, China, you know, coal is still very much part of the mix uh, in terms of getting the energy needed to uh, supply the society. So unless we have a concerted international program, you know, which is financed to allow um, developing countries to find alternative methods, uh, I think we are in trouble. But that's uh, kind of a long answer, but um, and, you know, not a definitive yes or no. I think there are reasons yeah, to be hopeful, but you know it means that we have to work. And you know, uh, I guess you know, uh, do I have an agenda as a as a teacher of environmental uh, and oceanographic uh, science? Well, uh, you know, I have a personal agenda and personal feelings, but I you know I can't too much allow those to in impact how I teach. But I do have the purpose of of trying to impress upon my students, you know, the very 
high challenge which we are facing as a society and the high level of work and commitment and willingness to sacrifice and explore new methods that lies in front of us. And I hope that, um, that you can absorb that and you can realize that, you know, yes, this is going to take an enormous commitment and enormous dedication if we're going to turn the corner. Well, Arta, I can actually tell you, I can actually tell you, uh, something about, um, I took a class with Dr. Manier about energy resources and the environment. And just earlier on this year, um, in the beginning of 2020, the largest investment company in the world, Black, uh, BlackRock Investment Company had released a statement that they are no longer going to invest in companies with large carbon footprint, which was a huge deal for our future, for future endeavors, which is, adds a little hope you know, for us that at least on a global scale, we are starting to, um, you know, have more environmental friendly economic gains. Well, sure. Um, a little bit similar when I would just want to say when I see a country like Denmark, for example, setting themselves a goal of by 2035, for example, wanting to be carbon neutral. That's also kind of on a global scale, a little bit of hope. Yeah, and Japan, Japan just announced today um, that, that, you know, that they want to be carbon neutral by 2040. Um, so, you know, there is a movement, there is yeah. pressure. And, you know, it's sort of like, you know, the sort of fossil fuel, it's also fossil thinking. You know? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, not looking ahead and not realizing, you know, that there are economic trends. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you, I, I have, a, I, I have, you know, I, 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 I'm an oceanographer, but I've you know, working in the Gulf of Mexico. I've had, had many friends, and I've had many uh, you know interactions with oil company scientists who I respect. Uh, and if you talk to them now, they know that you know oil and gas is not you know the future. So, yeah, I, I mean, know. you look at the discovery curve versus the production curve of oil, and any business, any investment company would look at that and say, oh. That's not a good, that doesn't, right. you know, the discovery curve is going down, but the production curve is going up and it's like exponential. It's, it's insane. So um, yeah. I feel like people are starting to understand that we haven't hit an oil, a massive oil since Saudi Arabia. We haven't really found a. Uh, well, the flip side of that is that, you know, if we don't do anything, you know, there's enough, you know, there's enough oil and gas and coal and other fossil fuels in the world Mm -hmm. to, you know, that we could continue consuming at the rate, we could increase our rate of consumption and still be able to find enough oil and gas to sustain that. So, you know, a, a society, an economy based on fossil fuel is not going to be limited by the availability of fossil fuel anytime in the next century. That's okay. a, you know, that's the sobering fact. So we, oh. <laughs> we could continue to extract enough oil, extract enough coal, to keep, you know, business as usual going, and um, you know, with the climate and uh, greenhouse and environmental consequences that that would bring, so there's not a limiting. You know, people used to say, "Oh, peak oil are running out." I, I don't agree with that. I think that although it's 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 you know, it is a, a factor that they have to invest heavily. You know, it, yeah. it could continue. Right. I mean, plastic production the option is isn't better, right? <laughs> Yeah, no. Well, the other option is, uh, you know, and I, I think that the, you know, the, you know, I, I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Hamayan, you know, talked about this, but the, you know, the the economic investment, the, the you know, the infrastructure, the jobs, the commitment. If we really did say, okay, we got to change this around. This is a serious, you know, challenge as World War II. Um, we have to apply all of the resources that we have. We have to borrow and invest and, you know, get people going. You know, if we did that, we could have an economic boom, um, yeah. I think. You know, I think we could really transition our economy. We could find work for people. We could, you know, mm -hmm. we could create a sense of purpose and hope that, you know, would transform this country, but also be an example for the world. I think we can do that. And I think we have the capital to do that. I think we have the you know, the, you know, the, the reasons to do that. What I don't think we have is the political will. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, so. I know, I really do question sometimes, you know, I mean, I knew in the president's, the, in 
Donald Trump's 2016 campaign, he did talk about going back to coal and, you know, boom bust the coal production. And I was, I just knew I, you know, I was just like, it's so interesting because you think about like, you know, first industrial revolution was steam engine. I mean, that's where you, the, that's the time frame that you're, you know, thinking. And I feel like with, Elon Musk coming out saying all we need is a hundred acre, a hundred miles by a hundred miles. And we could, you know, solar with solar panels and we could fuel the entire United States. I mean, you have these big companies, these big names actually coming out and talking about solar energy. So I do believe jobs would definitely come from those, that transition. I mean, absolutely. Right. But, you know, you know, there was a reason why I talked about, you know, how capital is distributed you know, early on in my lectures there, because, um, you know, the, the private sector, you know, has about seven times the, you know, resources of the public sector. Uh, and so decisions about how to invest that money and how to, you know, what kind of policy changes, you know, will support return on those capital funds, you know, are, are very much undemocratic. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, decision making. And, you know, that's why, you know, that's why there's such a, you know, freak out factor about this idea of socialism, you know, what's mm-hmm. being proposed, you know, is, is not socialism, in, you know, right. in the yeah. classic sense of socialism, you know, it's a sort of social democratic, you know, mm-hmm. social democracy light, you know, is what is what, you know, um, uh, Biden is, is, is talking about. Um, but, you know, the idea that, you know, money would have to be taken from the private sector and put into this public uh, need, you know, is really uh, disturbing to, you know, the ones who have the money. Yeah, I mean, they're already starting that with like FPNL and the solar power battle that you have here in Florida, where you have to first purchase from a private company solar power, then you have to, um, I don't know about, I believe they, you get like a tax cut if you like trade uh, energy for, um, if you have solar power and let's say you overproduce, you know, you have a, a net, po- a positive net production of solar energy, you give that to FPNL and they give you like a tax cut, but you still have to go through the private business of purchasing solar power to then installing it. And it's like so expensive, you know, and only it's getting more expensive, I guess, since you have this like battle where we can still frack and do oil and natural gas so we can make you know solar more expensive and yeah i was i was talking about the the with dr Manier. he also brought up the idea that they low when the price of when the oil is uh the price of gas is low they will you know take they will do a more expensive extractions into or when the price of oil is high they will they'll do more expensive extraction so they'll 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 uh, frack more or, or, and then when it drops down lower, then they'll go back to doing, you know, um, they like right. shift or something. Right. Was, so they're always trying to keep a, a profit margin. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're always trying to keep a profit margin. And it was, I mean, it really opened my eyes. That class was great. I wanted to ask other students if they were, if they, you know, had taken that class, but um, yeah, I've heard good things about that. He's well, he's he's uh, he's a really organized guy. So. Oh yeah, and he's he's incredible. I think he's a geo uh, geochemist, and he uh, discussed the whole the whole battle, the whole how ever since oil has you know come up in our society, it's really been a war. It's been a war on resources. All of the wars, you know, OPEC, he went into all of it, and it was just really eye opening, you know. So. Okay. Well, we better stop now. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoy these conversations, Professor. Like, thanks for, uh, you know, taking your time out. Okay, yes. no problem. All right, so I'll see you on Thursday. And yeah. I, all, the, all of the milestone uh, two things are graded. So mm-hmm. uh, some of the teams need to revise. So I, I forgot to announce that. Yes, I actually wanted to ask about that. Do we get to revise it or do we just turn in milestone three with all of it fixed? Um, well, I think I allowed some teams who, did you know didn't do as well as I thought they might have done to revise so usually I said um, uh, you know that revision is you know allowed or not allowed um, but uh, I, I forget what team you're on Bertha, but um, uh, I'll just take a look at it okay yeah. thank you sure all right bye now everybody <laughs>